on this Wednesday night. Wind, water, and violent destruction. Hurricane Michael explodes into Florida, tracking the strongest U.S. storm in 50 years. I've actually never seen anything like I've seen in these camps. The lives of the forgotten Rohingya, conditions of mere survival where hope lies far behind. Nala Ayed has a national exclusive from inside Myanmar. And Jean Chrétien speaking his mind as ever. You know why? It's because they cut the taxes for the rich and they need money. On Donald Trump's tariffs, the NAFTA negotiations, and his love of question period, he can take the former prime minister out of the commons, but this is the national. Residents in its path were warned to get out of the way. Many were even ordered to. Those who did not experienced a beast of a storm that actually got even more fierce as it headed toward them. One of the most powerful to hit the coastal U.S. in the last century and the strongest ever recorded along the Florida panhandle. Hurricane Michael came crashing ashore mid-afternoon. Its 250 kilometer per hour winds easily toppling beachfront homes, tearing off roofs and causing widespread damage to countless houses and businesses. This is a hurricane of the worst kind. The biggest threat, Michael's storm surge, up to four meters high, quickly swamping coastal communities where tens of thousands of residents ignored mandatory evacuation orders, perhaps not realizing just how strong Michael would be. And look at this, this is nature's fury probably like Floridians have never seen before. That's because overnight, what was a Category 2 hurricane rapidly grew stronger. When it made landfall between Panama City and Mexico Beach, Florida, it was just shy of Category 5. We are concerned that many citizens chose not to heed those warnings. Uh, but we're prepared with search and rescue teams to try to go in and, and do what we can. Even seasoned weather reporters seemed ill-prepared for Michael's fury, but as in this case, help is nearby. Wow. Thousands you. of National Guard troops were in staging areas, ready to help with the rescue efforts once it's safe to do that. We're turning 100% of our focus on search and rescue and recovery. Oh, my goodness. Hydro crews from across the U.S. and from Canada are preparing to move in as well. Downed trees and power lines have left hundreds of thousands of homes without electricity. And Michael's wrath isn't spent yet. The citizens in Georgia need to wake up and pay attention. The hurricane has now moved inland. Tonight, Michael is grinding across Georgia, still packing powerful winds, torrential rain, and the threat of tornadoes. Michael did catch a lot of people off guard, not only because it only started forming on Monday, but also because of how rapidly it intensified as it approached the panhandle. And once again tonight, CBC meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff is tracking the storm for us. And, and Joe, a lot of people surprised by how quickly Michael grew so strong. What was going on? Well, Ian, a couple of factors came together. First of all, Florida just had its warmest September ever on record, and that has contributed to exceptionally warm waters in the eastern Gulf of Mexico. That's the fuel that Michael needed to grow. Uh, we also had very little wind shear. That's winds of different speeds uh, that can help tear a storm apart. We had none of that. And finally, Michael did go through this rapid intensification process, going from a tropical storm to a major hurricane in less than a day. And that's part of the reason why why this storm will remain so strong as it heads towards the Carolinas uh, over the next couple days. A reminder, though, how these storms can be so predictable. And in the coverage, there always seems to be a buzzword this time around. I'm hearing a lot about hot towers. Yes, I was surprised this word sort of uh, was being used. I mean, it's a very uh, meteorological term. It's basically a very tall thunderstorm cell. And I think we've got a picture of sort of a vertical uh, profile of a radar shot. So these thunderstorm cells, these hot towers, uh, rise up to higher than 14 kilometers, so higher than jetliners actually fly. And this is an indication of how much updraft and downdraft is happening within the hurricane. These hot towers form right around the 
AI. And the basic premise of a hurricane engine is pulling in those very hot waters, those warm temperatures. Uh, as they rise, that uh, warm air condenses into liquid and releases latent heat energy. And that's the energy that drives the storm and causes it to intensify. So one study has actually shown anytime we see these hot towers in a cyclone, they're twice as likely to intensify rapidly over the next six hours. And that is absolutely what we have seen with Michael. As always, so well explained. Thanks, Joe. You're welcome. And take a look at uh, an incredible view from inside the eye wall of the hurricane. This was taken by a U.S. Air Force Reserve pilot today. His perspective and his story will be our moment of the day. Here's a look at what else we're working on tonight. Hospital workers in Winnipeg say they're on the front lines of a health crisis, why they're being attacked by patients. And a little later, we'll have another exclusive story from inside Myanmar. Nala Ayed tells us what's happened to those Rohingya Muslims still trapped in refugee camps. But first, the new twists in a growing mystery. What happened to Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi? Well, his fiance wants to believe he's still alive. They were supposed to be married this week in Turkey, but more than a week after he disappeared, her hope is fading. So she asked the U.S. president and the first lady for their help. Paul Hunter has the response today from Washington. The few images are tantalizing, if inconclusive. That's the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. And that's dissident Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi going into it last Tuesday. He's not been seen since. The presumption? Saudi agents were waiting inside where Turkish authorities believe he was captured, killed, and perhaps dismembered. The Saudis deny all of it. It's a terrible thing. Today, Donald Trump joined the growing international call for answers from Saudi Arabia. It's a very sad situation. It's a very bad situation. And we want to get to the bottom of it. Khashoggi was a fierce critic of Saudi policies, so much so that he fled Saudi Arabia last year to live in exile in the U.S. Today, Turkish news reports showed images they say are of a Saudi assassination squad who flew to Turkey and then left on the same day Khashoggi disappeared. One of the agents reportedly brought along a bone saw. Police are looking for this van, seen driving away from the consulate, even as Khashoggi's fiance stood by out on the street, waiting. The targeting and kidnapping. Back in Washington, demonstrators stood outside the Saudi embassy, demanding an explanation for all of it. On Capitol Hill, U.S. lawmakers likewise expressed outrage. It is not acceptable for any sovereign state to behave in this fashion. It's the law of the jungle and we will not accept it. If the Saudis did grab Khashoggi, he himself may have been unsurprised. In an interview this past spring, he told CBC News that soon after he fled Saudi Arabia last year, authorities went after his friends, rounding them up, arresting them. And, uh... Uh, I, I always regret being away from home, but when uh, uh, I see what happened to them, I, I, I think I did the right choice, uh, even though it is very hurtful to be away from home. In that CBC interview, Khashoggi said it's crucial that independent voices be heard in Saudi Arabia, just as his voice is being heard now, whatever his fate. Adrian. So, Paul, we know Canadian officials haven't said much that, you know, that they're concerned, they're waiting for more information, and maybe the limited comments are because this country doesn't have much leverage. But what about other countries like Britain, other entities? Well, there are certainly calls for the Saudis to explain what went down in that consulate. The U.N. wants a, quote, prompt, independent and international investigation. The British Foreign Secretary has called for urgent answers and says friendship depends on shared values. For its part, the Turkish government's response seems to be leaking to the press all that grisly speculation with an intent to put heat on the Saudis. Bottom line, pressure's on for Saudi Arabia to say or do something on this and soon. Okay, thanks, Paul. The CBC's Paul Hunter in Washington tonight. Let's bring things back to this country now and to a disturbing development in Manitoba where methamphetamines are taking a horrible toll and where the province is struggling to ease their grip. 
Cheaper than opioids, meth comes with less risk of overdose, but it's causing chaos in Winnipeg emergency rooms. Meth-related visits have spiked, jumping from 15 a month five years ago to an average now of 207. That's almost 14 times higher. Meth can also trigger violent, erratic behavior. As Cameron McIntosh tells us, that's a real-life concern for frontline workers. This is security video from the ER of Winnipeg's largest hospital. Watch the man with the dark hair. He's a patient. The man approaching is a nurse. In a split second, the patient attacks. Security intervenes. The nurse and three guards all ended up with minor injuries. So you're not allowed to talk about it. This nurse says meth-related violence is becoming common. We've concealed their appearance and changed their voice to protect their identity. I've been verbally abused, threatened, yeah, pretty much you name it, everything. I've been called every name in the book. I've been assaulted. In this case, police took the man into custody and say meth was a factor. It's an extreme example, but the nurses' union says violent incidents have doubled over the last year. It's calling for tighter security, including checks for weapons. We're putting our, our sanity, our well-being, our livelihood at risk coming into work. ERs are one of the front lines in what is being called a crisis in Winnipeg. It's starting to keep me awake at night. Police say it's now a bigger problem than fentanyl. Meth is a cheaper, longer, and less lethal high. It's a combination of all those that have made it a, really a drug of choice for, for the city of Winnipeg. Main Street Project Detox. At Winnipeg's only publicly funded detox facility, I meth now accounts for more than half the cases. Staff are specially trained. We're definitely tight and tasked. Um, I've had to double uh, some of my staff in some areas because of the potential for violence. We haven't seen a lot of violence. It's the people that aren't getting help showing up in ERs, often agitated. Nurses will be getting more meth training, but some are also considering job changes. Expecting to kind of get punched, kicked, verbally abused, whatever the case may be, I would definitely consider maybe something else. For months now, the Manitoba government has been under increasing pressure to come up with a meth strategy. The province says it will soon be making an announcement. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. Turning now to another front in Canada's drug consumption, this one though soon to be legal. Recreational marijuana, now just one week away. Some Canadians call it a progressive victory, others think it's still a big mistake. Either way, expect some bumps along this ride. Don't forget, when legalization kicks in next Wednesday, it actually only applies to certain cannabis products, like the plants themselves, their buds and seeds. Edibles, though, are still legally offline for the next year. Not that some crafty web-based entrepreneurs seem concerned about that. Catherine Cullen has the goods on that story. Well, it looks like I went to a candy shop because there's all these beautiful jewel colors and uh, juicy little sort of gummy bears. Or it seems like you can buy just about anything online these days, and that includes illegal pot product. It has this allure of professionalism. And it's efficient. It took less than 48 hours for our colleagues at Radio Canada to get a delivery with more than $100 worth of pot products, including edibles and concentrates, which won't legally go on sale for another year. We only had to show a copy of a driver's license. More than a dozen Canadian-focused websites are selling similar products, and with legalization looming, there's potential for confusion. This looks like it's pro. It's just, it's a beautiful packaging. It's properly sealed. Like you said, it's resealable. And so this looks like uh, uh, something that could have been dispensed by a pharmacy, for that matter, right? And so uh, other than the fact that it's candy in there and has sugar. Um, and so I could see uh, people uh, being confused um, because it looks legitimate. The new regulation but the minister in charge is adamant. It is illegal. It is clearly contrary to the existing law. And by the way, it will be against the law when the new legislation and new regulations come into effect. Any legal pot product has to be sold by a federally licensed producer through a provincially sanctioned source. Packaging will have an official THC symbol and health warnings. And again, edibles and concentrates will still be illegal for the first year. I would encourage you to bring that to the attention of law enforcement in the jurisdiction in which that is operating and give them an opportunity to do their job. 
We did ask the RCMP what it had to say. The force says it focuses on, quote, the most significant criminal threats and risks to Canadians, suggesting that if this issue didn't meet its threshold, perhaps a local force or another enforcement agency might look into it. All of it making it not quite clear just who is keeping an eye on the Internet. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. So just how easy will it be to get approved weed products next week depends on where you live. 90% of Canadians live within 10 clicks of a liquor store, but only 35% will live that close to an approved pot retailer. B.C. consumers have it pretty good, though. About 73% of people there will live within that sweet spot, as will 40% of Quebecers. In Atlantic Canada and the prairies, it'll be roughly half. Ontarians won't have any outlets until at least next April. They can order it online, though, or grow their own. We're watching several other developing stories on the National tonight, including a rocky day for North American stock markets. The TSX fell just over 336 points. That is the biggest drop in more than three years. While in the U.S., the Dow plunged more than 800. That's its worst in eight months. The tech sector was hit especially hard. That's Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Netflix all in the red. So what's happening? Some analysts attribute the sell-off to higher investment rates in the U.S. and fears of a looming hike here in Canada. Though a little perspective is always a good thing. If you look at the markets over the span of the past year, the Dow and NASDAQ are both up more than 12% in the S&P, more than nine. The sole responsibility for that motor vehicle being on the road on Saturday rests with Naman Hussein. So also tonight, a 28-year-old man has been arrested in connection to Saturday's horrific limousine crash in upstate New York. Police say Hussein is the operator of Prestige Limousine and has been charged with criminally negligent homicide. They say he was told by police and state officials that the driver he hired wasn't properly licensed. They also say the vehicle itself was deemed unserviceable last month. A lawyer for Hussein insists all the safety issues had been resolved. And the owner of the Calgary Trucking Company involved in the Humboldt Broncos bus crash has been charged. Alberta's transport minister says Sukhmander Singh faces eight counts of failing to comply with various safety and law keeping regulations. Singh was asked about the charges today. He said nothing. 16 people were killed and 13 others were hurt when that bus carrying the junior hockey team collided with a semi-trailer owned by Singh's company. The driver of the semi is facing separate charges. And also tonight, there is news that a prominent Canadian family has taken an internal dispute to an Ontario court. Frank Strana, the founder of global auto parts giant Magna International, is suing his daughter, former MP Belinda Stronach, and others over the management of the family company, the Stronach Group. The $520 million suit is said to have been filed October the 1st. And in a statement tonight, Belinda Stronic says she will respond in the normal course of the court process. Still ahead tonight on the National, Jean Chrétien has been retired for 15 years now, but he still doesn't miss a beat. We talk NAFTA, Donald Trump, and the one thing the former PM misses about the job. And a little later, Moscow's makeover. The Russian capital is getting a very expensive facelift, but at what political cost? First, though, Nala Ayed continues our special coverage from inside Myanmar with a look at the forgotten Rohingya, displaced and confined in refugee camps in their own country. I have been to Congo, to Chad, to Mali, places where there are huge humanitarian responses, where you see malnutrition, but I've actually never seen anything like I've seen in these camps. For more than a year, global voices have cried out against Myanmar for its persecution of Rohingya Muslims. More than 900,000 have fled a campaign of violence in a country that is majority Buddhist. Tonight we're going to show you the forgotten faces of this crisis, the Rohingya who didn't leave Myanmar. Their plight is different and it has been largely unreported. Nala Ayed and her team went to Myanmar, a visit that was tightly controlled by the government. Here's what they saw. They're confined to camps against their will. 
unlike Rohingya Muslims who fled to Bangladesh last year. They are still in Myanmar, displaced by violence six years ago, to just down the road from where they lived. The youngest have known no other way of life. We reached the Tekapin camp just before sunset on a trip organized by the Ministry of Information. All we got were glimpses. We came here straight from the airport. It's an internally displaced camp not far from Sitwe, where thousands of people live. I spoke to quite a few women who said that they have great need here. We don't have any support for health care, she says. Even going to the hospital, we have to pay ourselves. More than 130,000 forgotten and, like most other Rohingya Muslims, denied citizenship and freedom of movement. Very important. No freedom. Very, oh, please, important, important, please, oh, freedom. The government says it plans to close the camps, but a constant question meantime is how to help without helping entrench the segregation. I have been to Congo, to Chad, to Mali, places where there are huge humanitarian responses, where you see malnutrition. But I've actually never seen anything like I've seen in these camps. The Rohingya were not Pierre Pero has been going to um, Rakhine for five years for the UN's Humanitarian Rohingya Coordination uh, Office. Offensive. There's really a loss of hope for a lot of these people because they are waiting in this camp and they're not able to try to restart their lives. They're not able to try to go work. Their kids can't go to school. Um, and really they're in the kind of this limbo where they're waiting to be able to go home and unable to go home. Forgotten too in the events of the past year, an estimated half a million Rohingya Muslims who stayed in their homes in Rakhine State, a neglected region that's still tense and poor. Most aid was cut off last year. I'm concerned that there's a hidden humanitarian crisis happening that we're unable to measure. Last month, Myanmar allowed in some UN workers to try to assess those needs. The UNHCR says all communities are increasingly vulnerable, finding it hard to put food on the table. And that fear and mistrust are also getting in the way of moving on. In Shwezar village, ministry officials told us different ethnic groups live peacefully. On both sides, they duly confirmed that. But it didn't take long for the fear and mistrust to surface. A man looking for his cow recently was killed, says this Rakhine Buddhist resident. So we are worried. On the Muslim side, one man pointed out they don't have citizenship. How can we be happy if we're not equal, he asked. The UNHCR says the situation is so dire here that even now people are still leaving. And all this stands as constant warning to anyone who left, even thinking about coming back. Nala Ayed, CBC News, near Sitwe, Myanmar. Tomorrow, Nala focuses on Aung San Suu Kyi, the de facto leader of Myanmar. Her decades as a political prisoner earned her much praise and an honorary Canadian citizenship. But now she's lost both for failing to stop the brutal treatment of the Rohingya. We'll find out how her own people see her. She has made a lot of errors. She has made a lot of blunder. And I'm afraid to say that she's been ill-informed and ill-advised. But show me a person who can take her place for our democratic goal. She is our only chance. That's tomorrow on The National. But up next on The National, in-depth conversation with Jean Chrétien. I sat down with the former prime minister to talk about NAFTA, marijuana, and of course, Donald Trump. The view of America today is not the view that was America some years ago. You know, people don't take them seriously anymore. And it's sad. It's sad. But I've always been very much interested by politics. As Prime Minister and Cabinet strongman, Jean Chrétien shaped issues that still grab headlines. He brought Canada into NAFTA, helped craft the charter and its controversial notwithstanding clause. Way back, he even considered changing the legal status of pot. And now, with a memoir on sale next week, he feels like talking. 
So we did. We had an in-depth and wide-ranging conversation, and I started with a question on NAFTA. Mr. Chrétien, nice to see you. Nice to see you. You talk about lots of different things in the book, lots of different times and things that happened. I want to start with one, and that's NAFTA. So what did you make of how the negotiation unfolded? What did I say? I said, Trump cannot undo an omelet, and he will have to sign virtually the same thing. Mm -hmm. And it's exactly what happened. Mm. You know, they changed the name. That is his huge victory. The best deal ever signed by the Americans. But what happened? They changed some for the salary of the workers in Mexico mm -hmm. that, in theory, will help the Canadian workers. And they made a little bit of concession of milk that was the same concession made by Harper at the beginning of the negotiations for PPP on the mm -hmm. Pacific. The rest, that to change something in the mechanism of an organization that exists since 25 years, it's normal. The other reality, too, is all the rules you have, no, the Americans don't respect them. When I, when I was there, we, we took them to court on softwood lumber many times. We won all the time. And they just said, so what? Mm. And today, you know, why is he still taxing aluminum and steel? It has nothing to do with NAFTA. You know why? It's because they cut the taxes for the rich and they need money. In your book, you write about your friends, the Clintons. They're still your friends, Bill yeah. and Hillary Clinton? Yeah. Um, when Hillary Clinton lost the election, you, you had some tough things to say in this book about, about that. You say, it's very sad to observe the monumental error our neighbors to the South made in 2016. Do you still think that? The view of America today is not the view that was America some years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, people don't take them seriously anymore. And it's sad. It's sad because it's based on, you know, the fact that they have a president who is like that. And, uh, you know, they selected him, they have to live with him. But uh, for me, I don't think that internationally they have gained anything with Trump there. I think they, they went down quite fast. Mm -hmm. But I might be mistaken. I don't know. You ask my, for my view. Yeah. And But a lot of people laugh when you're abroad and you mention that name, Trump. You, you call him, in the book again, fanatical. Do you believe that, that he is trying well, you to? Know, you're listening like me. Mm -hmm. I was, as I wrote, he is responsible for the book because when I was fed up of some of his nonsense, I would go to my table to gain back my serenity. <laughs> so it's a reality. Yeah. So, you know, you see, you, know, you, see, him, you see him today, you know, uh, what he said on the judge's problem and what he said, you know, making fun of the poor lady who went on national TV to tell her story. Come on, you know, it, I would not be proud if my prime minister would have done something like that. 36 years ago, this happened. I had one beer, right? I had one beer. Well, do you think it was, nope, it was one beer. Oh, good. How did you get home? I don't remember. How'd you get there? I don't remember. Where is the place? I don't remember. How many years ago was it? I don't know. I don't know. It's weird, though, because he still does have a lot of support. But ask that to the Americans. Yeah. You know, it's life. Well. You know, like in Quebec, they changed the government. Never their economy was in better shape. Yes. They had the lowest unemployment in a long, long time. First time lower than United, uh, Ontario. No deficit, something that has not occurred in Ontario. Mm -hmm. Big signs we are in here. Nous en Beauchamp, all over Quebec. They've done so well that they had to change the government. <laughs> well, what, does the, what did that say to you then? But it's democracy. Democracy is not a perfect system. And why? We, there will be thousands of articles or analysis and so on. But what is the reality? The reality is there was no reason not to keep this government in Quebec. But I was in Quebec, and I could feel it, that they wanted to have a change for changing. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like when you have a car that is still good since four years, said, I had enough, I need a new car. You don't need a new car. Still, the car is still working well. 
But you buy a new car because you want to have a new car. <laughs> it's not very rational. It's the way that people act. The premier designate of Quebec, François Legault, got to work quickly, threatening he would invoke the controversial notwithstanding clause as a way to ban public employees from wearing religious symbols. If we have to use the notwithstanding clause to apply what won't, the majority of Quebecers will do so. Jean Chrétien is one of those who negotiated the inclusion of that clause into the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Here. In the book, you talk about the notwithstanding clause and how it was created and why it was created. Um, so why was the notwithstanding clause so important? The notwithstanding clause is important because you have to declare that you're discriminating. How many normal person we say, I want to discriminate. This is what the notwithstanding clause is. Despite of the equality of this and that, I will do that. Hmm. And you have to renew it every five years. So it was very seldom used. You know, but it is there because, uh, you know, it was the only way to have patriation. And on top of it, it would not be better if you have a, a government of judges were appointed for life. You see the debate in the United States today. Fair. Um, you, you said back in May that the government had no choice but to buy the Trans-Canada pipeline. Do you still think it was the right decision, even if now the future of that pipeline is less certain? But, <laughs> you know, you have to sell our, our oil. Mm -hmm. If we don't sell it, somebody else will sell it. So if you say we should not use oil, fine. But some, when you put it to the extreme, we should not cut one tree, we should not dam one river, we should not put one windmill because it's not nice to watch, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so you, we have to live with reality. You know, we need heating in our house and we need fuel to move to go to work. Of course, you know, it will not pollute if we were to all of us going home every night with Doug team but it might be confusing in Toronto a little bit. <laughs> so, you know, you have to live with reality. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they have to now, this goes back to your previous job as Minister of Indian Affairs, that they have to go back and, and consult with a bunch of First Nations again uh, to make sure that they are okay with things. If there are First Nations that still say, we still don't want the pipeline. Yeah, but there is always a moment when you have to decide. Yes. You're elected to do things. You know, consultation is one thing, but consultation does not mean that you have to decide for the person who is consulting you. The responsibility of the government will remain the responsibility of the government. Right. There will always be people who will not like what you do <laughs> because you cannot please everybody all the time. Uh, marijuana is about to be legalized. I never tasted that. I don't know. I don't have a clue what it is. Well, you were going to decriminalize possession. I for was for yeah. decriminalization. Yeah. Yeah. I was not at that time for legalization. But it's going to happen. Because I thought that a kid having a smoke a joint and to have a criminal record forever yeah. was unreasonable. The question of legalization, you have to understand that I was confronted with this problem 20 years ago. Yeah. So it's not today. It's different. You know, now they will legalize it in the United States before us. Mm -hmm. So. I have no strong opinion, I've never tried it, and I don't intend to try it either. You don't want to have a no, little, no? No, 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 no. Do you, 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 you still follow politics, you're, you're, you're up on current affairs and everything, do you miss it? No. No, why not? Because I had enough of it. <laughs> you know, 40 years, mm -hmm. you know, the only thing I miss is question period. I love it. Really? Oh, yeah, because it's, it's a great institution. It does not exist anywhere. They have it in England, but the prime minister in England received 48 hours notice before yes. a question, yeah. and he is there only for 30 or 40 minutes a week. I was there three, four days a week, and that was always an hour that I was looking forward to. Dites donc aux Québécois, comme vous avez dit aux Américains, nous sommes des séparatistes. Puis vous allez en manger une belle. It's a fun. You, you either fail or succeed. <laughs> if you gave a bad answer, you know, you have a problem. Well. If you have a good answer, you know, feel good. And you ask your staff. For me, I didn't have to ask my staff. Not at all. I would go there, and at the end of the question period, I would just do that. 
If it was dry, I had a good question period, and if it was wet, I had problems. So now I'm not too wet. I survived. Okay, we survived the interview. Good spot to end it. Merci, Monsieur Thank Chrétien. You very much. Un vrai plaisir. Bye -bye. Merci, j'apprécie. Wow, he is such a, 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 so impressive. I mean, partisanship aside, just plain talking, relaxed. I, yeah. I can't get over the fact he's in his 80s and, and uh, so clear-headed and so contemporary. What surprised you? Was there anything that surprised you about sitting down and chatting with him? No, just that he still wants to talk that much because after the interview, which went actually, you know, for about 30 minutes, he stood there and regaled us with tales for another 15 minutes <laughs> wow. about all the things that he was thinking about and things he had done. So, yeah, he's still, he doesn't want to do it anymore, but he's still watching it and he doesn't want to criticize anyone from the sidelines and get himself into trouble but he's still watching it all pretty closely well that's a good tip for all of us to know whether the interview went well or went yeah. badly i'll keep that in mind <laughs> thanks rosie okay ian's checking now <laughs> up next on the national moscow is undergoing a multi-billion dollar facelift an attempt to leave behind the drab look of the soviet era but even a change in landscape can quickly become political Moscow is a city with a storied past, but recently the Russian capital has been experiencing a shift, especially when it comes to public spaces. Call it urbanism on overdrive. But creating a more livable city comes with a political price. Chris Brown explains in tonight's dispatch from Moscow. These days, Moscow feels like a city that's found its groove. It's loaded with new energy and seems to be on a non-stop celebration of its culture, history and traditions. While Russia's capital has always been a place of power and importance, until recently, it wasn't that nice a place to live. With too many drab buildings, tacky shops, and uninspiring public spaces. Not so anymore. Moscow turned 871 years old this year, and at this extravagant street party, we found lots of people thrilled with what their capital has become. It's each year it's uh, better uh, because uh, a lot of new streets, uh, new parks, I think it's Moscow uh, each year better, 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 better. Yes. Очень красивый стал город. Ну раньше он, конечно, не такой был, но сейчас просто прелесть, прелесть. What's happening in Moscow has to rate as one of the most ambitious urban transformation projects ever attempted anywhere. But behind the new building facades and rebuilt roads and new amenities, there's also a shrewd political calculation about maintaining support for President Vladimir Putin. After all, Muscovites have been known to take to the streets when living standards drop. That happened most recently six years ago. Putin's administration has learned it's important to keep people in the capital happy. And Moscow's silver-haired mayor, Sergei Sabanyan, Putin's former chief of staff, is getting much of the credit for doing that, at least from Kremlin-controlled state TV. It recently aired an hour-long tribute documentary, listing among Sabanyan's accomplishments a program called Maya Ulitsa, or My Street. In just three years, 300 Moscow streets were narrowed and the sidewalks widened. 12,000 buildings received facelifts. Thousands of kilometers of ugly overhead wires were buried under those crisp, clean new sidewalks that are also punctuated with more than half a million new street lamps. The joke here is that dug-up sidewalks have become so ubiquitous, the sidewalk paving stone, or plitka, is the new symbol of Moscow. The city has become a showcase for urban renewal, 
and young architects from across Russia are coming to learn what might work for their communities. And to get tips from top international architects, including Canadian Michael Geller. If there were Canadians watching this presentation, they would be very surprised because they do not appreciate that you have so many beautiful, lively streets. Geller has flown in from Vancouver. One day you will all come to Vancouver. At the invitation of the Strelka Design Institute, its, its consultants city. have led many of the new projects. Geller is sharing how Vancouver has improved by creating density in quality public spaces. But after seven visits to Moscow, he seems to be taking as many ideas back home with him as he's giving. Each time I come here, I go back to Vancouver and say, you know, there's lessons we could learn from Moscow. And one of them would be what? To pedestrianize our downtown. We talk about pedestrians being important, but the quality of our sidewalks isn't as good as this. We don't have streets like this. A decade ago, Moscow had just one pedestrian street. Now, there are a dozen. This is a downtown area called Kuznetsky Most. Street cafes are everywhere. Push scooters and electric ones have replaced vehicles. And when you do need a car, Geller says ride sharing is ubiquitous. I use Uber to get around. If anybody in the BC government is watching this, Chris, please encourage them to bring an Uber. The cost of this transformation is unlike anything ever attempted in any city in Europe or North America. Three billion dollars U.S. to be spent by 2020 just on Moscow. To put that in perspective, that's a third of Russia's entire municipal budget directed at the capital. Only in a country where power is so centralized in the Kremlin could that ever happen. And those costs don't include this centerpiece, Zeriadre Park. An oasis of nature and culture, it's just a stone's throw from Red Square. And at a quarter of a billion dollars, it's likely the most expensive park built anywhere. You, you can't purely celebrate places like this without, without trying to probe into, into the politics and, and the economics of how they work. British anthropologist Michael Morosky has spent a year studying why Vladimir Putin's regime has invested so heavily to transform Russia's capital. With this single gesture of Putin's, the golden land next to the Kremlin was given back to the city and its inhabitants. So it's this extremely kind of grandiose gesture of gifting which ties the park uh, uh, inherently to politics. The park's defining architectural feature is a platform that sticks out halfway into the Moscow River, offering spectacular views of the city's famous landmarks. <laughs> In a surreal scene when it opened last year, Putin took what seemed like a victory lap as the band struck up the theme from the last Austin Powers movie, The International Man of Mystery. It's hard to know what the Kremlin was getting at with that, but many here now refer to this place is Putin's paradise. Well, it's is designed to, is to create um, support for, for the regime, and this is very much the message here that, uh, that you know, you have received this park, you ought to be grateful. Authoritarian regimes have long used beautifying cities as a way to glorify leaders. Still, what's happening in Moscow begs the question, can such improvements in urban freedom encourage greater political freedoms as well? It's much too early to say whether Zariadi and Maya Ulita creates, uh, creates a kind of, a kind of uh, democracy and freedom through architecture. The only things we have to go in so far is that people take many more selfies than they used to in this part of Moscow and on the Garden Ring, uh, and that people have voted for Putin in much larger numbers than they did previously. Moscow's renaissance is impressive, yet in other ways superficial. Daily commutes on clogged roads are still punishing. But Moscovites seem more than prepared to accept the deal Putin has offered them. A better, more beautiful city in exchange for letting him run Russia his way. Chris Brown, CBC News, Moscow. Up next on The National, we'll take flight into the eye of a hurricane.
Earlier in the show, you saw powerful images of Hurricane Michael. Now we want to give you a different perspective, this time from someone sent in to measure the storm. Captain Will Simmons has flown into many hurricanes in the past four years. He captured video while flying through the eye of the storm. That is our moment of the day. Michael was, was angry, if you will, as he was growing in strength. This one, to me, I will remember it because of how quickly it intensified. I actually flew it Monday morning as a tropical storm. And here we are, you know, 48 hours later or so, and it's almost a Category 5 hurricane. It's a, a bumpy ride to get there sometimes, but the center of the eye is, is pretty calm. Uh, the clouds really clear out, and you saw from the video that you see what's called a kind of a stadium effect. You look up, and there's just clouds kind of all around you. You're just kind of like in the center of it. Even I was impressed just by looking at the satellite, but once you get out there, everything just kind of stands still almost. It's uh, really surreal. So Michael will be one that I remember for a long time. Okay, that's not what I thought it was going to look like at all. But he, no. he did that flight nine times and went into the middle there, that calm part, six times. That's how many times he, he went to get this information. Yeah. On, on purpose, voluntarily, yes. <laughs> Voluntold yeah. job to do it. Um, I, I, it's interesting, he was talking about uh, the storm is being angry, and uh, when our producer spoke with him, uh, they had a whole conversation about every storm from that perspective has a personality, mm -hmm. and, and they come to know them as, you know, for their quirks. It's, I suppose, a much, I mean, as scary as that is, I think I'd rather be looking at it from that perspective than being on the ground. And of course, we talked about he's doing measurements there, they're trying to understand more about these storms, and I think one of the lessons of Michael is after so many storms that kind of petered out or didn't seem as strong as officials warned, this one was way stronger. And it's a reminder to, to expect uh, anything, I guess, when these storms roll into uh, places like Florida. That is The National for October the 10th. Good night. Good night.